Well, yeah, and we can we can certainly continue, especially in lieu of anything else, except we do have one other thing. And thanks for sharing, by the way, Michael. But yeah, one uh, question in chat. Thanks, G. Yeah, thanks, G, for the question. Um, I see that you can't talk, but at least you've chatted, so that's good. But yeah, one of the questions, I guess, for uh, the new guy and myself, uh, says, I'm a deist for reference. Question for the Christians. I've noticed that most Christians only reference Paul when talking about the New Testament, Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, etc. It seems that modern Christians follow Paul and not Christ. Um, then the follow-up, has modern Christianity lost the Christ in favor of the, quote, militant and tribalistic statements of Paul, end quote. Um, I would say it's one and the same. So a lot of times, funny enough, Hebrew Israelites will make that argument and say, you know, you Christians follow Paul. But if, I, I mean, you know, this is self-explanatory. Uh, so I guess my only answer would be, if, you, if someone will just read the Bible, you will see it. And, you know, to, to not say you have to read like a thousand page Bible, um, I can help by saying, if the question is the New Testament, um, just read the New Testament. So then you'll only have to read like a third of the Bible to get a full comprehensive answer. But Paul and Jesus say the same things. So, you know, whenever we talk about, uh, you know, things, you know, because Jesus um, is in the Gospels and he's crucified and resurrected. So um, from that point on, the things Paul says, you know, obviously Jesus didn't really talk a whole lot about like church order. And, you know, there's stuff that Paul and Jesus um, talk separately about. Uh, sometimes about the gospel, the stuff that Christians believe is actually important and the thing you must get right, well, there's overlap. You know, Jesus says things like, believe in him and you'll never die uh, spiritually. You'll be born again. You'll live forever. You'll have eternal life. And Paul echoes the exact same things. Uh, and then, you know, when they talk about different things, like, you know, Paul doesn't really teach in parables and Jesus does. So it's not that they contradict. They just talk about completely different subjects. Um, and then when Paul, um, yeah, so I would say that, like anytime there's overlap, um, about the gospel and the thing that Christians actually need to believe, Jesus and Paul say the exact same things, which is all centered on Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And to the one that believes in that and confesses Christ as Lord, repents and follows Christ, they are saved. They've, they've won the prize in that simple, short paragraph of beliefs. Um, so I would be curious, G, if you wanted to follow up about like any specific discrepancies. Um, the only one that I can immediately think of, you didn't ask, but you know, while, while you're replying, if you are, um, yeah, so overall, they say exactly the same thing. And as evidence, read the New Testament and you'll see. But one thing that, you know, for example, the Hebrew Israelites bring up a lot is where Paul says salvation is for everyone. And they will try to say that Jesus says, well, you know, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And then they'll stop reading the Bible there. And I, I assume they just close it and don't read it anymore. Because he says he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And then he goes on to say about, you know, how, how the people rejected him and how, uh, you know, uh, He's become a stumbling uh, a stumbling block to them, but he's the cornerstone. And then he sends his disciples out uh, into the world and says, go into all the world, making disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So, um, you know, even Jesus says that the gospel is for everyone. And when he says whosoever, that means whosoever. And when he says all, that means all. So I would say that would be one thing um, that I'm most familiar with because we hear it all the time that people say, you know, they contradict. But again, if you just read the Bible, like they clearly do not. Um, hope that helps. But yeah, gee, if you have a follow-up or if I didn't address what you were saying, please let us know in chat. And Daniel, since you're new, yeah, have you figured out like if you swipe uh, swipe right? It yeah, you can show see the you chat. The, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Daniel, and, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, gee, I'd be curious too if you, if you get a chance. Uh, could you elaborate a little more on, you said, have we lost... Christ in favor of the militant and tribalistic statements of Paul. And I'd be curious what, if you would go more in depth on militant and tribalistic and, and kind of where you're headed with that. It, it's funny when I, when I hear statements like that, it, it even, even me. So like if, <laughs> from the heathen perspective, um, it, I wouldn't say that a Christian was following Paul. I would say that they were, they were just reading what the spokesman had to say, for lack of a better term. You know, so like, you know, so Jesus isn't there anymore, you know, and you know, Paul's like a spokesman kind of thing. And, but, but you hear that a lot. And I think sometimes it's, it's nitpicky, almost in a way like people are trying to say, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're deifying, uh, you're, you're deifying this person, right? So, um, 
and then I've, I've heard people try to say, to try to throw um, Christians under the bus and say, you know, oh, you know, you know, uh, you know, commandments, you know, don't have any other gods before me. And it sure sounds like you're, you know, quote unquote, you know, deifying, uh, deifying this person who, you know, but again, I think that's nitpicking. I just, you know, I like and the term spokesman. I appreciate that. And here's like some, you know, biblical insight. Um, I'm just going to read three verses. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 4, seemingly this very topic is addressed. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither one plants and neither one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So uh, there would be some biblical insight. Even the people in question, even Paul in question, um, is saying, look, don't follow me. Don't follow him. Don't follow men. Follow God. So everyone you know, who follows Christ is a servant of Christ, and everyone has their part. And you know, they get, Paul goes on to talk about, and you know, the rest of the New Testament goes on to talk about how you know everyone is a part of the body of Christ, and you know some are compared to like you know fingers or arms or legs, basically meaning everyone has their their part. Um, so some are pastors, some are you know homeless shelter workers that give out food and shelter and clothing and things like that. Some are doctors who heal the sick, um, for example. But ultimately, we shouldn't be looking to any man; we should be looking to Christ. Hope that helps. Felix, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you hear me good? Uh, kind of. You're a little choppy and a little... Sounds like you're in a wood shop or something. But... Uh, see, man. Yeah, I'm in a wood shop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I would say is... What I would say is... Um, Paul is in the Bible for a reason. And 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 the reason why... I, I myself gravitate towards Paul's teachings a lot. Because... Because Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, you know, to the church that was, that, that mainly is composed of Gentiles now, okay? So, Paul was given certain mysteries that were not given to any other apostle. I mean, not even, not, not even Jesus revealed some of the things to, to the 12 that he revealed, revealed to the, uh, to Paul. And, uh, and so, Paul even says himself, be imitators of me like I am of Christ. So to follow Paul is to follow Christ because Paul was given these, 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 uh, this revelation, okay, and he was given the instruction. I mean, if you notice, Romans through Philemon is what he wrote, and it's all for the church. It's doctrinal. Jesus did not teach church doctrine like Paul did, but Jesus gave Paul the revelations of these doctrines and the understanding, I mean, how else are we going to know um, that that from from the two people, Jewish people and Gentiles, God was going to make one one people, unless he, he he revealed that to Paul. That's in Ephesians, you know. So it's important that Paul is in the Scripture, and if he says, "Be imitators of me, like I am of Christ," so basically, you know, you're following Christ if you follow what Paul what Paul teaches. So, um, yeah, gee, I saw your follow-up. Thanks, Felix. And yeah, we heard all that. Um, so the follow-up is, for example, Romans 1 is thrown around saying all believe but don't want to admit it, hence tribalism. I would disagree. But it goes on to say, personally, uh, that can only create division as, as it is one of the most arrogant and self-righteous statements you can make. Perhaps militant was a bit strong. Well, I, I would also say, you know, it's how you understand it. And, and I would, you know, hope that people would understand it the way it's written. So it is a claim. It's uh, that, that's what it is. Right. So when people say, prove it, I don't know God exists. Or like Michael will say, look, I'm an atheist. I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you to the best of my ability. I don't know that this God exists. But, you know, and I take him in his word. So understanding it the way it's written, Romans one, where it makes the claim that everyone knows that there is a God. And if you keep reading, it doesn't specifically say the Christian God and Jesus Christ, uh, anything like that. It makes a very broad, almost like deistic claim saying that at the bare minimum, just by looking around, like, you know, even, um, you know, even people that had many gods, 
um, you know, even though we would say it's the wrong one, even though Paul, who wrote this, would say it's the wrong God, we, they would still say, well, look, even these people are aware that they didn't get here by happenstance. So in that in that context, everyone knows there's a God. And then the claim says by looking around, by looking at nature, observing uh, essentially order from order. So it's not that we got order from chaos. I mean, this is, you know, modern speak. But he's saying, look at the trees, look at this, look at the beauty, look at all these all these like natural things you can look around and think something put us here. Like there is some something like the hand of God or the hand of a creator that got us to this point. So that's the claim and that's how it's meant. Um, and then the further the theology that comes from that is for, you know, like a, an atheist who says, look, I'm an atheist. I'm telling you to the best of my ability. I don't know there's a God like you say. Well, the theology behind that is. Based on what I said, look, at, at some base level, everyone knows that there is a God, at least a deistic God to start. And then if someone doesn't know that or is not aware of that, personally, I, I believe the theology would go something like, uh, you know, we have these pivotal moments in our life. And, you know, if we choose, because, uh, you know, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, you know, if we have this amount of faith that we can exercise to, you know, explore the possibility could there be a God? Could this be true? Could the Bible be God's message to us? And we don't just shut it down. Then I believe, you know, we'll be given more, more light or more insight or more knowledge to this God. But if at every turn in the road, we, we have chances throughout our life that we can accept what God is giving us and, uh, you know, pursue that road further, which will lead, I believe, to Christ in the Bible, to Jesus and to this, you know, subjective evidence that God is real and the Bible is his word or uh, however many chances we get for this, if we do the opposite and just shut it down and we're like, no, no, prove it, convince me. Nope, 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 nope. And just shut the doors. Then, you know, we, we can eventually, if we do this enough times, sear our conscience to where we are in a position where we legitimately can say, we don't have any idea that there's this God you speak of. So I, I believe that's, uh, you know, the Bible, what it means. And then when, when Christians commonly say it, that's the theology behind it. Hope that helps. That's a very, very generous um, offering, Nate. <laughs> it's, it's one of the reasons I, I continue to appreciate you. Um, it, but it, it, it provokes a question because, um, you, you know, you said, you know, you give these hints and, and stuff like that. Um, do you think it's possible for an individual to choose to believe something? Uh no. So I, I'm one of the, and, and it would, um, one moment, text message. So I'm someone of the opinion that no, you, you can't uh, choose your beliefs. Um, and then, you know, depending on how someone nuances that out, I, I could be compelled to agree with whatever they say, but no, I, I don't think you can choose your beliefs. If you choose your beliefs, um, the only way that can take hold really is if you just brainwash yourself. So I believe, you know, if you're if you take in evidence, if you take in data, if you open your eyes and, you know, talk to people, read, look at stuff, then you're taking in information. So wherever that whatever that information tells you, that's what you're going to be compelled to follow. And, and you are powerless. So, you know, if um, I don't know if, if Jesus visits you or you see a vision and it is so real to you that you're compelled, like you've been visited by the God of the Bible, you will be powerless to deny that. And then you'll be, you know, one of us. Um, and everyone else will be asking for proof. But if you, uh, and you're like, oh my gosh. And the only way I believe, uh, it, and this is all predicated on whatever subjective bark, uh, markers you have to believe. So if you're not convinced, then obviously whatever subjective bars you have were not met. So then you're like, no, nah, it must have been a bad talk away last night. And because of, I had that religious discussion. So if you're not convinced, well, then it wasn't, it didn't meet your markers for convincing. If you are convinced, well, then it did. And you can't deny that. So at that point, I would say the only way someone could choose their beliefs in, in that circumstance is to try to brainwash themselves. And I mean, you know, we see it happening on religious and non-religious sides alike. Um, you know, you, you hear someone talk long enough and the reasoning they give you, you think you have probably successfully brainwashed yourself. Uh, but yeah, Michael, does that answer your question? I don't believe you can can choose your beliefs. Yeah. So there's there's yet another thing you and I have in common. It's called doxastic involuntarism. Um, basically, that you don't need that. Yeah, that, that's a, a really big worded way of saying you can't choose your beliefs. 
Um, and, and, and that's how I feel as well. And it's interesting. You talk about, you know, the process, um, uh, Matt Dillahunty, a somewhat infamous, uh, atheist who actually, I, I don't really get along with. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he said, well, he doesn't like me, but that's, that's a longer story. Um, <laughs> uh, he said once he said, um, belief is the process of becoming convinced that a that a proposition is true or likely true. And I very much agree with that. And, and so it, it, it's interesting what you say. And I, I appreciate not only what you said, but the way you say it in that, you know, there, there will be things that will, you know, everyone's bar for convincing, for being convinced is different, right? Um, and I do think, I, I also agree with you that you can, I don't believe it's searing your conscience. I understand why you think that, why you think it's that particularly. I don't think it's searing your conscience, but I do think that you have the capacity to become very jaded towards even the possibility of something being true or likely true. And that's where I think you have to, where you talked about brainwashing yourself. I think you have to continually check yourself and try to do your best to be open and honest, right? And and to look at whatever is presented to you, whether it's presented to you by somebody else or by some um, phenomenon, right? Like I remember when you and I were speaking, it's probably more than a month or so ago, and we were talking about a very specific thing. It was about Romans 9, I think it was. And you had said, you know, normally you would just say, I asked you a question, I can't remember the specifics, but it was very much like... Um, I had asked you a question and you would say, oh, it's normally just Romans 9 and I would just end it at that. But you said that the the way I asked you the question provoked you to go into greater detail. And then you you alluded to the fact that that, you know, that could have been coincidence or it could have been something more. And you said, you know, you know and you, you know, kind of humbly suggested that I take that into consideration, right? That it was something else and it wasn't just offhanded coincidence. So it's those, it's those types of things. Like in that instance, that didn't convince me. Right. <laughs> Alas, I'm still an atheist. But um, but I do. Anyway, it's a long winded way of saying I think we're on the same page and I agree with what it is that you're saying. Sure, I, I appreciate that. And I mean, you know, I'd like to hear what the new guy has to say in a second. But um, I'm I'm also, um, you know, reminded, like, for example, the Bible uh, says in Joshua, I think it's 23, like when, uh, you know, these people um, are being led somewhere. And they're grumbling and complaining. And, you know, he does say he finally has enough of it. And he's like, okay, look, choose this day who you will serve. Will it be, you know, this God, that God, the God of your ancestors? Or will it be, you know, uh, but he, uh, he says, choose who you're going to follow. But he says, for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. So, um, you know, I just want to be clear. So things like that, these are people who already believe in, you know, the God of the Bible and all these other gods. So when it comes to choosing in that regard, it's not like they're choosing to believe. It's like, you know, choosing who they're going to side with, who they're going to follow. Um, you know, and, and I know that everyone would resoundingly be nodding their head yes, because, uh, you know, it's obvious we're talking about two different things. But just for the record, yeah, I mean, in that case, you can totally make it a conscience choice. Like, OK, well, look, I believe in both of these gods. Here's the plan for following one. Here's the plan for following the other. I'm just going to choose to follow this one. So at that point, like, you know, it's not like we're, we're still talking about we've moved away from can you choose what to believe in this paradigm? These people believe in all of it. It's just what are they going to do with that belief? Follow one, reject the other. So just just wanted to make that point, I guess, preemptively in case someone wanted to go there, because I do quote that often. It's like, look, choose this day who you're going to serve. Um, but, you know, that would imply that they already have a hard and fast belief in the choice they're about to make. But and that's a really interesting point. So this is something that Daniel mentioned before. It, it ties into something Daniel mentioned before about about um, uh, denominations. It also ties in a little bit with what um, the question that G asked about uh, tribalism, because I like as as an outsider, I I see tribalism all throughout the Christian community. It's it is a it is it's as plain as day. It's as, it's as easy to see as the green grass I'm looking at in my backyard. Um, but it, but it's an interesting point. So, for example, when you said, 
um, you know, there are people that have these beliefs, right? So, for example, sects of people who identify as Christians, but who you probably, and I think most Christians, even I, I'm not necessarily convinced that they're quote unquote Christian, um, like um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and so, you know, some of the other kind of really kind of uh, different <laughs> uh, denominations of Christianity, right? They have, you know, they have a belief not only in a God, but a God of the Bible. And they've just come out and interpreted it in these other ways. Now, Mormons are different because they have the whole Book of Mormon thing, which is a whole different kettle of fish. But so you have those people and you say, well, OK, so uh, like what you said like with Joshua, you know, um, choose to say you're going to serve. Or, you know, we're going to serve the Lord. Um, if you contrast those groups of people. So if you contrast the believers who who are who are who believe wholeheartedly that they are doing right, following the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. Even though there may be, sometimes you could sit down and point out to them and say, well, there's actually ways you're not following the Bible. But they believe they're being, you know, good, honest people and they're doing their best uh, to live, the, live this life daily. And then, you, and then you contrast that with someone like me who, you know, and I appreciate when you said, you know, you take me at my word that I don't have knowledge that this God exists. Um, and who just, you know, tries their best to be a good person on a daily basis. And... I'm curious as to how you would look at the, when, when you look at, okay, so, you know, like that verse you said from Joshua, you know, choose your, who you're going to serve. Who do you think is, and this is obviously going to be incredibly subjective, but if everything ended tomorrow and, you know, judgment day comes and all that other stuff, and you have these groups of people who were like, because the Bible does say, you know, I, you know, on the day people will say, you know, you know, didn't we do these things in your name? And, you know, God says, you know, I'll tell you to go away that I never knew you. Where do you think those lines will be drawn? Understanding that I'm asking only for your opinion. I'm sorry that was so long winded. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I believe it's it's going to be like we talked about when I, you know, I, I expounded on the Romans 10, 9 and 10 that you brought up because, you know, it says at a glance, it says, you know, everyone that believes God raised Jesus from the dead and confesses him as Lord will be saved. But I, I really believe it's everyone that knows what we're talking about, like the right God. I, I mean, which that's easy. If you claim you're a Christian, then you surely are talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but then the right Jesus. And, you know, that's where the Mormons and Jehovah's Witness, they manage to mess up the right Jesus. So, you know, I, I confuse them, but I know they both have their extra work, like they have the Book of Mormon and Jehovah's Witness has have like, the, you know, the, the watchtower thing, like it's an extra pub publication that goes hand in hand with the Bible, which, you know, I mean, in Christianity, that's, that's kind of a big no, no, uh, you know, don't add to or subtract the word of God. And, you know, how do we know the Bible is the word of God and it's the way it's supposed to be? Well, because that's the one we have and that's the way God meant it. Uh, this is, you know, this is the claim. This is the view. So, you know, to come up with your extra book that says, you know, the scripture uh, of back in the day when everything was compiled was not good enough. And there's been extra special revelation you know, after Revelation, after the book of Revelation, uh, that there's actually a special knowledge. Um, and, you know, Jesus is really the Archangel Michael and the brother of Satan and all these other things. Well, well, that very clearly is not the Jesus described in, in Scripture. Um, you have to make an extra book to make it say that. So I, I really think, um, you know, maybe somehow by the grace of God, but, um, you know, the way I understand it now, no, they, they, they mess up Jesus. So, you know, it's like you may as well be talking about some other idol or something. So I think those those people are probably going to have a tough day. Um, you know, I think the ones that are talking about the the right Jesus, um, you know, those are the ones he's talking to. Um, and, you know, I think that encomp encompasses the overwhelming majority of Christian denominations. So, you know, when people just pronounce judgments like, uh, you know, um, I, I don't even know. But like, uh, you know, Catholics aren't Christian or if Catholics say Protestants aren't Christian. I, th I feel like that's splitting hairs too much because if you want to say there's some denominational discrepancies and teachings that are wrong, I would agree with that, um, you know, on, bo on both sides, depending how far you whittle it down. But to pronounce judgment on everyone that calls himself a Catholic or a Protestant, that's just, you just can't rightly do that. And I think the person doing that after you, you know, talk them down a little bit, they're like, oh, I see. Okay. Because someone could be new to, uh, you know, Protestantism or Catholicism and, you know, they may not be aware of the certain teaching that they find problematic. Like maybe all they heard is, you know, the talking about the right Jesus and everyone in, in the in Catholicism and what we're talking about gets that right. 
everyone's talking about the right God. Everyone's talking about the right Jesus. Everyone places faith in this Jesus. So, uh, you know, they're good. Uh, perhaps if someone is an ardent apologist for one of these like problematic positions um, and they know better, but they're not doing better, that may be a little dicey for them. But ultimately, you know, I don't like passing judgment because, you know, there's one judge, right? And that's God. What do, what do you think, Daniel? Do you have any thoughts on this new guy? <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I got pulled away for a minute. I was still trying to catch up on the conversation. Um, I'm going to, that's all right. To fill me in on the last two minutes. Oh, okay, no problem. Um, Michael, you want to do a quick recap? Uh, I went on a long, I went on a well, okay, 10 second Coles notes. I went on a long diatribe about which Christians are the right Christians, basically. I got you. Okay. <laughs> so, welcome, Steph. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Daniel. So, tell me as far as like where you're headed with that when you say which are the right. I mean, and I guess what you're saying is, is, is Nate, is that I mean, are you getting at the, the, the core of? I mean, are we saying different Jesuses? Is that what we're trying to say? As in the denominationalists follow basically a different Jesus or? Uh, I'm saying specific, I'm saying the, I, I believe personally, this is Nate's opinion, that most people that call themselves Christians are on solid ground. I believe there are a handful of exceptions, like, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. I would like to think by the grace of God, Jesus will do some quick correcting, but ultimately who knows? Or like, you know, some will say, you know, if you're not a Trinitarian, you may as well be an atheist or you may as well be a uh, Satanist. Uh, cover your ears, Jamesy. But, um, you know, effectively saying they're, they're not Christian by any stretch of the mean uh, imagination. I, I have trouble going that far because, again, to say like, you know, everyone that calls himself a oneness person um, is automatically uh, wood for hellfire. I don't know. Like, how long have they, you know. Um, known about this? How long have they known about Jesus? Have they heard about the Trinity? What have they heard about the Trinity? And, you know, like, so I don't believe you must believe in the Trinity to be saved. Um, I do believe in the Trinity. I believe it's accurate. But to pronounce judgment on everyone that says, no, they don't, they don't believe the Trinity or they don't really understand it. Again, like if you're an ardent apologist against the Trinity, I think that's problematic because, you know, we're told that if we're saved, we have the Spirit of God living with us, guiding us into all truth. Well, I believe that, you know, all truth would include the Trinity. So if someone comes up with not the Trinity and it's not just because they misunderstood or haven't been exposed to it, um, well, that, that, in my opinion, as someone who believes in the Trinity, and I know they would say the same thing about me, but still, I'm the one speaking. So I think that would mean that they are misled. And if it's not the spirit of God that's leading them, it's some other spirit that's not God. And that would be problematic. I, I believe that's how most people who say, you know, non-Trinitarians are like, hellfire for or wood for hell that's why they get that because they believe their interpretation is correct which i do too ergo if someone has a different interpretation it is not correct so they do not have the spirit of god leading them otherwise we would all have this trinitarian belief uh, but then we went one step further and just to wrap up i don't mean to put everyone to sleep but we talked about mormons and Jehovah's witness who very clearly have the wrong jesus they're just not talking about the jesus in scripture they had to invent extra publications to make their case. Um, that's, that was like a four minute recap of the last two minutes. Yeah. And so if you think about to, I mean, let's look at how we get to that place as a culture, especially a Christian culture. Okay. So, so we take information in that we have available at the time. Okay. And then we, and we say, well, it's this way or it's that way. And, and then we, as we study and we learn and we get more information, especially you know, as the, as the world becomes smaller, as technology is more available and we are able to learn more about the, you know, the roots of, as a Christian, the root of my faith is, is Jewish. So, so as I'm able to study and more understand the culture, the Jewish culture, especially in a time like that, then we, we learn more about who Jesus is and who the roots of that faith. So, so I think it's probably short-sighted to say that, you know, anyone who in any specific aspect of this type of Christianity or whatever, I think we get hung up on that too much as Christians. And like, if you don't believe specifically this, then you're just not a Christian. And then I would at that point then turn around and question that person and say, well, you know, if, if you have the spirit of God in you, so why, why would you then at that point 
be so judgmental to your own brother or sister in Christ? And why would you not be like be able to have a civil discussion on this and, hey, let's research this and let's talk more about it and see where you're coming from on that. And, and I think we've done ourselves a disservice in Christianity to, to harp on things like this to say, well, if, if, if it's not so specific in this. And again, there are important issues. Don't get me wrong. I mean, like, you know, as as Christians, we have to have, we have a foundation of what we stand on. But but again, based on where people are from, you know, what information is available. Well, yeah, we can we can have dialect and dialogue on that without pulling swords out and cutting each other's heads off, so to speak, over it. And so I don't, that doesn't really answer any question. But but I but, I, you know, I'm a little bit sensitive to that. I just think that, you know, I, I think that's short sighted, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I sorry, I really like the idea of you know more grace than less, um, you know, while also not compromising. So you know, someone, I mean, there are lines, right? So someone's like, I'm a Baptist, uh, I don't know what I was going to say. Like, if someone says, you know, I'm a, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm a, you know, Presbyterian, uh, you know, great. As far as I understand, you know, the fundamentals, we're all talking about the same Jesus. We're all good. We can argue about secondary doctrine. Uh, until Jesus takes us home, but we can continue arguing about it in heaven because we're all going to be in heaven. So we're on the right side. If someone just says things that are clearly um, anti-biblical teachings um, while calling themselves Christians, then, you know, I think we have to take a stand and draw a line. And, um, you know, I guess that's that's just a case by case uh, basis, which does happen sometimes. But, you know, I like to give the benefit of the doubt um, until I can't, um, you know, just trying to be a good, responsible Christian that's not compromising. And also not, you know, trying to say everyone is wrong but me. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I will say that there are there are people that you will find, and this is this is a, just a uh, you know the the heathen's opinion to Daniel as, as a the quote unquote new guy on Clubhouse. Um, you will you will happen into lots of different rooms, and in some of those rooms you'll find people like Nate and Steph and uh, Malik and um, Philip and others. And then you will find others who will not be <laughs> anywhere near as charitable, generous, kind, forgiving, patient, or any other pleasant adjective I could possibly think of. So you, you, will, you, you will happen upon both of those types of rooms and I'm not going to say any names because I don't want to poison any wells. Um, you'll learn soon enough all, all on your lonesome. Uh, Steph, would you like to explain that giggle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael, that was so delicate. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> hey, I, I'm a social worker. Yeah, which, uh, which shows. <laughs> That's some serious discipline. There was a bunch of trauma yesterday, Nate. Uh, well, it wasn't, I shouldn't say a bunch of drama, but there was a, so this conversation started and I asked a Christian, what was it yesterday morning? You guys about miracles? Oh, did you, did you guys start a room? I didn't see one going. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It was the day before the day before. Oh. Remember when we were talking about abortion and then it switched to miracles. And then it was like, I don't know if you were there, but oh. it was miracles all day. And then <clears throat> the reformed guys were doing the room in the evening. So they took over at around five o'clock and just kind of kept it going. It was like Brian and Odie and Todd and you know, those guys. So, okay. yeah. So this conversation about miracles went on and on and on and on. And, and Christina was in the room um, and she was kind of asking questions sort of like, well, what about this? And what about that? And it, it became an interesting conversation, but it was like eight hours. And then it continued yesterday and was another eight hours. And then in the evening, Christina was on stage again in a room. Um, the reform guys actually made an ask a Christian room outside of the club to continue the conversation. Um, so anyway, Christina was in the room yesterday just asking questions and one of our reformed buddies went after her in the chat super hard and then made a room and then posted his doctoral thesis on why she's evil in another room. <laughs> so that happened. Did it, did it start with a C? Sure did. Goodness. So, oh yeah, Shawnee just got here. She was there. So yeah, it was a, it was a thing where he like posted it publicly on Clubhouse for everyone to read. Charles nice. was not happy. So and Lou, I've, I've been trying to invite you up. I see a little hand raised. Um, so if it's not working, leave and come back. But I'm trying to invite you up. 
In the meantime, uh, Anthony says, did you know that in the past man lived in the jungle and houses were caves? Slowly man began to discover many things. Um, okay. Was that just uh, the more you know or was there um, the more you did you want to did you want to comment on that or, or expound on it? Um, and Kowami, welcome. Yo, what's up? Peace to the How's family. How's it going? Going well, pretty well as far as I can control it. What? Kwame, could you back today? off the mic just a little bit? I didn't quite understand what you said. Is it still too loud? Oh, it wasn't loud. It was muffled. That's better. Oh, okay. Now I'll stand peace to the panel. Well, thank you. Back at you. Anything on your mind today, or are you just listen for a bit? Uh, yeah. I just want to know what physical evidence do y'all have that Jesus died and rose again? Uh, well, the surviving written pages uh, with, you know, the testimony of observers on it. I would say for physical evidence. So you're basically just going by what a book says? Nope, not at all. Uh, you just said the surviving pages, so that you, you go by what, what a book. You asked what physical evidence we had. So is that so is that evidence really credible, or is it just faith? Well, I think it's credible. I think a lot of historians and archaeologists would agree it's credible. But I mean, if you want to know, if you're asking for why I believe, I think the better question would be, what evidence do you have? And I would say, you know, we we have certain physical evidence, like you know, the aforementioned pages, but also we have this this spiritual evidence. And although it's subjective, uh, subjective, I don't think that automatic, automatically makes it bad. So I would say, you know, my whole existence um, feeds into this evidence. Ooh, Lou, that's loud, bro. Did you hear all that, Kwame? Yeah, I heard, I heard all of it. So basically, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say some so. The, the evidence of Harry Potter existing is because of a book. If I had so the if same I, spir if I had the same spiritual evidence that Lord Voldemort priest spoke on him, Lord Voldemort and Harry Potter was real, then I would say that would be equivalent to my faith and belief in Christ. However, all I have uh, for the physical evidence that Lord Voldemort and Harry Potter peace be upon them is real is a book in whose author from inception says it is a fictitious work. She could be wrong. Voldemort, peace be upon him, could be real. And J.K. Rowling could be wrong, even though she thinks it's fiction. But, uh, you know, I am just not convinced of that. My spirit does not bear witness to that. Does that make sense? So, uh, so, how, do you, so how do you know that it's a spiritual thing? How do you know you're not feeling other deities? Like, you know, because, you know, other deities that predate Christ. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to go on a limb and say Christ is a copycat of everything that predates him. Because this, this is what supposedly happened two years. I mean, not, uh, not two years, but 2,000 years ago. And then the Bible, the King James Bible was written like 500 years ago. Oh, so all this stuff is written. So hold on. So all this stuff was written after he died. And then if y'all want to bring up Josephus, Josephus was born in 37 CE, you know what I'm saying, after he died. And then y'all want to bring up Tacitus, which was born in 56 CE. So all this stuff was after he died. You well, know what I'm no, saying? So I, where did they get that? Hold on. So where did well, they get their evidence from? Well, I mean, as far as I know, Josephus was a Jew and Tacitus, um, you know, there's no uh, there's no evidence. I, I don't think there's any record of what his theological belief was. So, um, you know, their evidence would be uh, purely natural, uh, you know, based on, you know, th I mean, they were both historians. One was a Jewish historian. One, I think, was a secular historian and a records keeper. So um, any of their evidence would have been just like you. Like if you were one of them back in the day, you probably wouldn't have believed any of the spiritual stuff, assuming, you know, you were not a Christian or a Christ follower. So you would have just looked at the records. You would have looked at, you know, the common lore in the area, the common sayings that people had, things like that. But uh, no, I wouldn't have gone to either of those. I mean, unless appropriate, but in this case, it's not. I would just say, well, going on again, if you whether or not you believe it, like the story of Christianity is for, it goes all the way back to the very beginning. So if people want to argue on dates and say, well, you know, the earth is billions of years old and you Christians are trying to say it's uh, 6000 years old. N none of that matters because people can get dates wrong. But the claim of the Bible is the story goes all the way back to before matter existed. So this is when the origin of Christ was. It was before anything. So like his origin is always existing. 
So when we're talking about, you know, Christ being born as a human and saying he's, he's God, follow him, uh, things like that, I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page that, you know, the claim of the Bible and Christians is Christ predates everything. You you know that right? I mean, whether you believe it or not, you well, I, right well, I, I, I know the well. I know the story. I know what that's what's claimed. But how can right. Christ be born before he was born? No, that's what I'm saying. Always existed. So when he came, I mean, this you is like a Muslim you. argument. So right, right, right. So so like a a Muslim couldn't have asked that question better themselves. So the first time Jesus shows up in in material form as a human being here on Earth. That's not the first time he's existed. We believe in the spiritual world that you deny. We believe in the spiritual world that he has always existed. So whenever he just put uh, a body to it, that's not the first time he existed. That's the first time he came as a human. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense when you are uh, looking from the, the realm of belief. Uh, because like I said, you know, when it comes to us atheists, we require evidence. Uh, because I, I feel like your argument wouldn't even stand up in court, you know what I'm saying, what you just told me. And I'm not well, denying anything. It's, it's like, it's like, where's the proof of this? Because y'all y'all are saying, oh, it's the spirit. Do you even know the etymology of the word spirit? Do you know where that root word, that word come from? Do you want me to break it down? Because it comes from, it, actually, it's a Greek word. It means wind, breath, or air. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a pneuma. And then it transferred into Latin. And then it transferred into, um, no, it was actually Hebrew. It was, Greek, Hebrew, then Latin. You know what I'm saying? All of it means wind, breath, air. It does not mean some ghost that's walking around zapping feelings in people's right. body. You know what I'm saying? So, so when you look at the word, the, the etymology of the word spirit, it does not mean what you're trying to make it mean. Well, no. Actually, what you made it mean is exactly what it, it – uh, so, you know, I, I often would say a spirit is ghost you, kind of tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, whatever that would mean. But a couple things you said. So, one, uh, I think a lot of what I said would stand up in court because, you know, eyewitness testimony – does hold up in court that's a valid that's a valid evidence in the court of law so whether or not you meant it to go there eyewitness testimony and recordings count as eyewitness testimony could act absolutely be submitted in a court of law i don't care about a court of law but for the record it could be um secondly uh, when you said wind breath and error you basically made a secular case for genesis when it talks about you know god breathed into adam uh wind breath error he, he breathed life into adam so thank you for making that point. Excellent Christian point. But 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 um, the other, though. The, but well, that hang on, one, wait, 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 wait. I, I'll let you speak. Let, let me finish. I just had one more thing to say because uh, you know you said a lot, so I want to be able to address everything you said. And, and then I would say for me, ultimately, when you just say it's belief, you, you make it sound uh I don't know, you cheapen it somehow. And you make it sound like you're there's subjective experiences in your life that if you were true um to what you're saying now, like you know, Christians shouldn't just believe because they just happen to believe. Was well, based on subjective experiences. So, by your own metric, you would have to you would have to say to be right that you couldn't believe a lot of things that you do in your own life based on your subjective experiences. Like if you've touched a hot stove, you've got a subjective experience by, by yourself. You, you're right there. No one else may have been around you, but other people could corroborate just like other people could corroborate their subjective experiences for Christ. Um, but ultimately, if you were the only one that burned your hand on a hot stove, you now live your life as though that experience is true because you got burned. You, you sense it. You felt it. So in a similar way, that's what we're saying. We have subjective evidence for Christ. I've called the name of the Lord. I've done what the Bible says to do. And I believe I've had this spiritual experience. Uh, and I don't mean some goosebumps or warm fuzzies. No one means that. But this spiritual reckoning, like this realization uh, from the God of the Bible. So although it's subjective and I can't prove it to anyone else, I've had this. This makes up who I am. So I could not deny that anymore. You could deny, you know, maybe you touched your hand on a hot stove and now you don't do that anymore because you learned your subjective lesson. Uh, you want to respond to that real quick? Yeah, uh, but see, the thing is, we have evidence that stoves exist. We don't have evidence that Jesus or God exists. So I think that was kind of a false equivalent, you know what I'm saying, in a sense to where you said I'm burning my hand on a hot stove. I'm pretty sure there's plenty of people that burn their hand on a hot stove, just like you can say there's plenty of people that said they felt the hand of God or they felt the spirit of God in them, you know what I'm saying? But we have proof that stoves exist, but we don't have proof that God exists, you know what I'm saying? So well, he, sure. you just said that you don't have proof that Jesus exists, but, but again, like if you look, you brought up Josephus, but all he was was an, was an historian. So all he did was gather evidence of what was going on in the Jewish world at the time of where he lived. And 
there was the evidence pointed to, you know, he was a family of a Jewish priest. And, and, and if you follow the, the story of Jesus in the Bible, then you would understand the correlation between, you know, Jesus and, and, the, and the priesthood at that time. And, and, and that, that being the, the group that put him to death for claiming to be God. So, so again, if you're saying that proof of Jesus exists, I mean, that's, that's no different than writing a, a history book on World War II and gathering evidence on it now. I mean, we have more technology now to say, oh, well, there's video. But, but at the time, you know, we had historians that just gathered information. And so, you know, and, and it's proven true or false based on, you know, the, the length of how long it's, it's made it without being you know, proven false. So if, if you gather evidence and you say, this is what's going on and you see the evidence that's going on around it. And then you say, okay, well, I'm just collecting what is going on and, and, and enciphering through what's true and false. And you, and people say, oh, well, this is false and it's taken in or out and, and, and proven. And then that's just simply, you know, gathering evidence. So you, you're talking about the, the existence of Jesus historically is, is considered fact by historians. So a lot of these historians, historians y'all are talking about didn't even witness his Jesus' death. They just talking. About, they just basically going by hearsay. And you got to look at the times too. The Christian faith was really created in the first century CE. You know what I'm saying? And I think Jesus died so, shortly after that. You know what I'm saying? Supposedly, allegedly died but, after but that. Historically, and on a, I'm sorry. I didn't but there's that. no historical. I can say there's no historical evidence because if I ask you where is Jesus at now and how did he get into heaven? Would y'all be able to tell me well, without, without, without breaking the laws of fix, physics? If I, if I told y'all when he died and he died in physical form, cause he didn't, he, cause I'm, I'm, I'm y'all, ain't, you know, cause he went to go eat. So this man came out of a tomb and asked and, and asked for fish and food. So did he really die? Cause I did not know spirits need to eat. Well, so you know you, well, okay. Well, there's a lot of things. And I also want to address something in chat, but I mean, there's a lot of things you're saying, like basically even, I mean, even as hopefully a good moral atheist without the belief in a god or gods, you would say, hopefully, on further analysis, your question is a little off kilter. Like you're basically saying, how can you explain uh, the things that God did? But by the way, no God stuff, bro. No God stuff. It's like, well, wait, how are we supposed like our, our whole thing that we believe happened, like 90 percent of it is in this spiritual realm that you deny the existence of. So it's like, hey, tell us how this spirit did spirit stuff. But no spirit stuff. So, I mean, it's like, okay, well, you see what no, I'm saying? What, what like, I'm saying? How, how no, what I'm... To that? Yeah, yeah. No. So, I, I, to, yes. Hang, hang on real quick because I want to get someone in chat real fast. One second. So, someone in chat, Anthony, could you clear it up a little bit? You quoted Ezekiel, but then you said you quoted Matthew. Is it because of what we touched on earlier that, but answered and said, I am not sent into the lost sheep, but of the house of Israel? Do you want to explain what you meant by that? Um, was it the discrepancy between Peter and Paul and how they say the same thing because Paul says it's for everyone and Jesus, if you keep reading, says it's for everyone. Is that why you posted that or something else? Just let us know and we'll continue. But yeah, uh, Kwame, so where were we? Yeah, so I mean, explain how where Jesus is. Well, the Bible, which I believe Jesus resurrected and he had this glorified body and yeah, he ate some fish and stuff like that. We're not told he had to. Like, Maybe he did it for, uh, maybe he did it to be social. Who knows? We don't know the reason. We're not told he had to eat to sustain himself, but we're told, you know, he had some fish and stuff like that. But then we're told that, you know, he ascended. So he was taken up into heaven. So that's, that's the answer. Um, if you want us to prove it in debate, we may not win a trophy or get a medal, but that is the answer. And I know you've read the Bible a lot of times, so you know that too, right? Well, yeah, I, I know the story, but like I said, sure. we don't have evidence, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I got to take a phone call. I will be right back, Nate. And it was good talking to you once again, friend. And peace to the panel. I'll be right Always back. Always a pleasure. Uh, James, Nate, did you, you uh, get to address oh. with him? Because I stepped outside real quick. Did you get to address with him that the King James Bible was not the first Bible? Or did we just kind of let that one slide? Uh, we just let that slide. Okay. He, he said a lot. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I know he knows that. I hope he knows that. But... Yeah, for the record, the King James Bible was not the first Bible. Because that's what they go to. That. Like, the argument then is that it's an entirely man-made political thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you, you almost have to clear that up before. But I think you're right. I think he does know that. But that, that King James argument gets kind of funny. 
And then I always come back to as much as we can know anything in ancient history, we can, you know, if you're going to pick apart the Bible, you got to pick apart all of it. You can't, you can't accept some parts of, you can't accept Egyptian history and not accept the history of the Israelites. Like you, I don't know. It's tired. I mean, I, I've never met, um, you know, I've never had a heart to heart with Washington, but I can tell you he opposed tyrants. Um, you know, does that, is that a faulty belief? Should that? No, Nate, how do you even help? know he existed? We, we can't even I, go to the tyrants. How do you know he existed? You weren't there. I, I guess my belief is shattered. George Washington is not real. We do not live in where we think we live. Is this, is this England? Are we still in England? <laughs> yes. I think it's a time for tea. I think it's interesting. The, um, yeah, it, it's funny. There were foundationally a good number of things that Kwame said that I agree with. Um, no, uh, the historicity of Jesus is not one of them. Um, I've, I've said this before in this room. I like, I, I don't care. Like, if if I read someone like um, uh, Bart Ehrman and others, you know, I walk away pretty sure, you know, pretty sure that Jesus existed. If I read, you know, Bob Price or some others, you know, I may come away thinking he didn't he didn't exist. Um, Jesus mythicism is really, 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 really hyper fringe. Um, so, but but I, I don't have a horse in, in that race because I don't care whether or not the the person Jesus existed. It's the supernatural claims attributed to him that we could we could uh, talk about. But yeah, there's like I said, there were some foundational things that, with Kwame that I agreed with. But um, yeah, maybe you know differences in delivery, but whatever. <laughs> I am certainly not perfect. Uh, well, no, and yeah, that's so a Anthony... good point. Like, uh, oh. oh yeah, last thing on this. Uh, uh, it's it's a good point, Michael. Is that we we have to? I feel like when I'm addressing somebody who has these kinds of questions, these prove it questions. It's like, well, do you believe in the historical Jesus? Are we just talking about supernatural claims? I mean, I got the feeling that he was completely rejecting the reliability of any kind of scripture, which then you have to get into and say, well, okay, what else about the ancient world do you accept? Because what are your criteria? Right? It becomes, yeah, it, it becomes a whole thing. So that that uh, separating the spiritual from the historical is is difficult. I don't think a lot of them realize that that's what they're doing, that they're combining them. Yeah, it's interesting. So Richard Carrier, who, who is, you know, is, you know, kind of an infamous mythicist, he wrote two really interesting books. They're really, really hard to read, like read them with a bottle of Tylenol. Um, the first one is called Proving History and how he uses, how he lays out basically a, 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 a blueprint for how historians go about "Quote unquote proving history," uh, and he uses Bayes' theorem. And then in his second book on the historicity of Jesus, he applies that, and I think as an absolute layman in history, misapplies it to the actual historicity of Yeshua. Good, like like I said, I'm I am more convinced now than I was previously that that he existed. Like I said, I don't have a horse in that race. Um. But if you want to look at how history is pr like to say that the to for someone to say that the Bible doesn't contain any historical accuracies would be a very risky statement to make. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think, Steph, I, I agree with you overall. Well, it also goes in the idea of uh, just when something he said and, and, and Nate alluded to it, but but he kind of went back to it was that Christianity was Christianity was invented in the first century and you know as a christian we would all disagree with that but uh, yeah to the question anthony so yeah we did we did address this earlier um i you say uh, you think god is only for israel uh so do the hebrew israelites peace be upon them uh, but no if you keep reading like you know jesus uh paraphrasing says he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Then he goes on to say, you know, um, they rejected him and didn't recognize him. And then uh, the Bible talks about how, you know, God is going to use these Gentiles to make, you know, the actual house of Israel 
um, you know, look, look bad and uh, look shameful because even they recognize we, everyone who's not Jewish recognize, uh, you know, God and will follow God. And he says, now everyone is adopted in the family. And when Jesus, you know, it's called the great commission, just, um, you know, Google great commission Bible. And it says, so like this culminates when Jesus says, look, go into all the world and preach the gospel baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making disciples of all nations. So if someone just, you know, cuts and pastes and reads that, that's why the Hebrew Israelites think that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you just read the whole story and everything Jesus says, it culminates with everyone. So whosoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. There is no longer Gentile, nor Jew, Greek, nor, you know, yeah, the whole thing. Oh, hey, I should also bring up, uh, I had a, um, a CA forum room going a couple of days ago, and uh, Lookup, uh, pardon me, Lookup uh, was in there. And so, yeah, he's, um, I'm dragging him over to the side of heresy, just to let you guys know. Okay, that's probably fine. Oh. Bye, Lou. Nice knowing you. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> he can't even talk. He can't defend himself because he's at work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's, Lou, I'm sure I heard he's you screaming were... at his phone right now. I, I heard you're making voodoo dolls and like into witchcraft. I heard all kinds of stuff about Louis. Did you guys hear that? Well, we well we started a sacrifice and then he had to leave, and so he missed out on that little part. But but he was game for it, so I think that kind of makes him <laughs> guilty by association. Come on, Lou. Come on, man. I saw Silver Star down in the audience. I guess he had to leave. Oh. Too bad. I like Stacy. I haven't talked to him very much. He's crazy. He's a uh, like he's well. I don't. Did I tell this story? If I if you've heard this story, tell me to shut up. You've heard the story. Shut up. Okay. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Stacy and progressing progressive progressing pilgrim are the reason I'm on Clubhouse. Did I tell? Did I say this story before? I don't believe so. So, so our 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 dear friend whose name shall not be mentioned, um, there was a Tom there was a Tom Rabbit video of him basically tearing up this this um, woman named Connie. Oh yeah, and, I remember that. Right, and so uh, Silver Stacy and Progressing Progressive, I can't remember this, whether it's Progressing or Progressive uh, Pilgrim, basically did a video. Uh, calling him out, you know, for what he did and, and how, how much of a monster he was for doing it. And of course, Tom Rabbit posted that video and I consume a fairly healthy amount of Tom Rabbit material. So I saw that and that was, that was my first, I didn't know what Clubhouse was prior to that, but I thought these are two people that I can, I can hang with. I can get along with these guys. So I went on to Clubhouse and to specifically seek out those guys only to say thank you for holding, uh, you know, our dear friend whose name will not be mentioned to, you know, accountable for his horrible actions. And you weren't on Clubhouse prior to the Connie fiasco? I was not. Not in any way. Oh, I thought, wow, I thought I knew you a long time before that. Nope. Nope. That was my first, that was my first foray into Clubhouse. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad that I, that I did. Um, because you know now I've you know I found rooms like this where I can talk to you know decent uh, decent people like you guys. So. Uh, Lou, anything you want to say to defend yourself? No. Okay. <laughs> we love you, Lou. As far as I know, you're not a devil worshiper. Um, Jamesy, I saw you were driving. Are you still not speaking? In three, two, one. Still Hello. silent. How are you? Hey, good, you? good. Doing well. I, I'm just trying to read up on this cursed scroll thing. The the article I found said that there's a correction in it saying it's like not to correct, not to verify the Exodus, but to verify like the true age of the Bible. Yes. I, I'm still looking for like where it was discovered. So it was discovered on Mount, uh, what was the name of it? Mount Arret. It probably says it in your article. I forget. But it's discovered where we would expect them to be during the Exodus and dated to the time that we would expect them to be during the Exodus. But the, it's a curse scroll, right? There's no information in it. We don't know who wrote it or what. But what it does is it 
places the written Hebrew language much, much, much like hundreds of years earlier than we thought it could have been, which allows for validity to the argument that uh, the there were writings during that time. So yes, it's not a smoking gun for the Exodus, but it certainly is in the right place at the right time. And then it, it brings the date of Hebrew writing way, 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 way further back than we thought. An interesting tidbit. Yeah, so, but like my understanding is like Hebrew people existed like as a nomadic people or like a like a hill tribe people. And they like came down from the mountains. Um, so like I, I don't understand how that would compete with like the narrative that I already understand. Wait, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that last part? Your mic is low. Sure. I, I, I'm having trouble understanding like how this would challenge the narrative that I already understand and how it would confirm the exodus. Like, it, I think most like archaeological historian people are kind of looking at the exodus as like there was this group of people that like joined the kingdom of Israel like at a later period. And they kind of like invented this uh, this story to kind of justify that influx, the, that immigrant group. I gotcha. So, so th it's not a smoking gun for the actual exodus, right? But what it does is when when we claim that the Pentateuch, the the first five books of the Bible, there are written when we say they were, we didn't have any evidence that there was even a Hebrew written language at the time at the time that the exodus would have taken place. So this scroll being in the accurate, expected Hebrew written language and dated to the correct date that we that a Christian would expect them to be, uh, it's it's evidence for the fact that the Pentateuch could have been written when we say it was right. So again, not a smoking gun, but prior to finding this, the consensus was that the Hebrews didn't have a written language at the time that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were claimed to have been dated to. Now we know that, hey, they actually very much could have been because they were writing in the language that matches in style and in, um, you know, in style and in uh, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the letters, the uh, whatever. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's written in the way that we would expect those five books to be written. It's dated to the correct time. So it allows for Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy to be placed correctly without argument uh the argument being they didn't have written language does that make sense like it like it changes it it nullifies one of the arguments it's not a smoking gun yeah okay like i that makes sense hey steph is there any evidence of the two or three there was a couple million people that were supposedly in exile right i actually did anyone know. out well yeah did anyone outside of the the story of the Bible actually write about this Exodus? Like, do we have any evidence from the people that supposedly were there? Well, yeah. Before it was compiled into the Bible, it was and completely uh, extra biblical writing. Before like, someone took it and threw it in the Bible. We have records of the conflicts going on between the Israelites and the other warring nations, right? So, but the, like, the um, Egyptians don't have any record of having all these. Israeli, Israel, uh, Jewish slaves. There's a lot of Egyptian history missing, right? So yes, that is curious. Why wouldn't they have right. a writing about, right? But they were not a culture, like we don't have every, you know, we don't have every recording of everything that happened in Egypt. When we find a new Pharaoh, we're like, oh, holy crap, who's this guy? Where do we place him, right? Like it's, it's kind of difficult. But the yeah, Babylonian- The story just seems really far-fetched that they would just let, you know, millions of people, slaves go and just destroy their economy. Like they were doing well, all well, the work. remember uh, the Egyptians completely destroyed all evidence of Pharaohs that they just didn't like, right? Who was that female Pharaoh? And I forget her name at the moment, Hatshepsut, maybe? Uh, where they just like completely destroyed all record of her. And by accident, people discovered her like recently, like within the past 30 years. So the, the Egyptians were also famous for destroying records of undesirable events. Again, not a smoking gun, but it's not totally unfeasible that they wouldn't, you know, have. It's not a, obviously, it's not a smoking well, gun. It's not really evidence. Well, Mo, let's let's keep in mind that, you know, the story is predicated on, you know, you say, why would they just let them go and ruin their economy? Blah, blah, blah. Well, remember the story. Believe it or not, the story goes that if true, it makes sense. 
it wasn't. They're just like, all right, guys, go ahead. You've been great slaves. You right. Know, God sends course. down the, right. the plague. So, right. So, I mean, you know, if someone wants to continue, um, you know, doubting the Exodus and, you know, that and whatever, um, you know, that's your right. But I will back off uh, gingerly and let that person call the entire Jewish people liars. Um, I won't be a part of that. So um, I'll just back out and let you take that argument straight to the uh, Jews. So you can call them all liars, but I don't want to be a part of that conversation. Yeah, I think it's just mythology that was made up that was passed along. But that's fine. Yes, Go ahead, Jamie. Well, we well, if there's not evidence of it and, and nobody actually wrote about it except for in the Bible, there's no reason <laughs> to believe it. But th- that's a job. I mean, again, that's that's like saying. But, but what that's historian like taking, they, outside of the Bible wrote about Persia, Babylon, Judah? These were all nations outside of the Old Testament that have record of conflict with the Israelites. I'm not like talking about entire, conflict. I'm talking about that document that a, during their they this nomadic period, and though. B, okay, that they, that they were in the desert. Roman. Do you not believe years. Persian writing? Are you going to reject like what came out of Persia well, about the, about yeah, conflicts with the Israelites as well? Like anything that has to do with the Israelites, you're just going to wipe what it. What does like, conflicts have to do with it? Conflicts doesn't mean that no. they were roaming in the desert for forty years, does it? No, that's what. No, yes, it does. So what she's saying is, if it, the only reason they had conflicts is because, like, you would have to be in proximity to have a conflict, right? So if they were somewhere far away they probably wouldn't have wrote about it because they wouldn't be around them to have conflicts. So the fact that they wrote about all these conflicts means they are in proximity during their trek across the desert, which is why they even know about them, which is why they're in proximity to have a conflict while they're just roaming through their area. Makes sense? That's what she's saying. And these Not are writings really. that didn't make it into the Bible. Like we have, so, we have plenty of other evidence outside of just the Bible for this entire time period of, of the Hebrew history. Do they teach the Exodus story? And if you studied um, Egyptian history, would the Exodus story be in, in the no, history? No, but that's my point, right? Why? That there, because there's a ton of Egyptian history missing. We have okay. better so records. You, it's all just Hold on, Mo, all, Let me finish the thought. Missing? We have better records of the goings on of Israelites than we do of Egypt during this time period. Now, all of Egypt, actually, like through their entire existence of ancient Egypt with the different kingdoms, we have pretty decent records as far as uh, ancient text goes. But during this time period, we have more extra biblical writings about the Israelites than we do about Egypt. So you're not going to learn about this, but there's also a million other things in Egyptian history that you can't learn about because there's no record or it was wiped or we just don't know. Well, Mo, uh, read. I keep wanting to say holy moly, maybe someday, but until now, just Mo. Uh, read, read Orchid. I mean, he seems to be citing a lot of stuff. Like, I don't want this to, Who? you know, use the guy in chat, flip over to chat. Like, assuming you, you, you know, you really want answers. It seems like this guy's providing you lots of reading material that are non-biblical sources. So like Hoffmir, um, yeah, just, just flip over to chat. Um, he's saying Exodus conference actually showed a huge amount of evidence that Exodus did happen and all the scholars agreed. Read anything from Hoffmir. Um, perhaps he's not able to speak, but yeah. The Exodus there conference. you go. Homework, Maul. Do, oh, do the go. homework. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar well, with it, but, you know, read up on I, it. I, I just asked you if there was, I just wanted to know if there are historians. I, I mean, there's two or three million people is what the estimate is that were in exile somewhere in the desert. We have no physical evidence anywhere. There's no cities. There's no, nothing like that. And then and it doesn't seem like there's any, um, anyone that, that wrote about it. Outside oh, okay. So but we're telling you oh, okay, that's so, not uh, true. You just don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But who is it, Steph? Without saying Mo. that there was a conflict. Oh my, oh my God. Oh my God. Who was Mo. it? Mo. Okay, stop. We, we have to be done. off the top of your head? I just don't. Literally. Okay. I, I, I have less and less of a dog in this fight each time we go around. But literally, your answer, okay, your question, it, it just started two sentences ago, two paragraphs ago. You said, why are there no cities? We're talking about a nomadic tribe wandering in circles for 40 two years. Two million people, Nate. And, stop, stop. And you say, why are there no cities? If you are wandering in the desert, are you going to build a city? So that was your question. I'm not even going to answer. It's self-explanatory. The so, second should... question, wait, 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 stop. The, the second question you have is what extra biblical source do we have a name? Don't we know off the top of your head? 
And we are literally pleading with you to look in chat. And in case you're unwilling or unable to the swipe Exodus right, conference. we, okay. we, we look said, at that. so type Exodus. Uh, so, okay. So if I were you, Mole, if I were a godless atheist looking for answers, and I said, do you have a name outside the Bible for evidence? And someone said, Exodus conference, Hofmir. The first thing I would do is thank you for your time. You have answered my question. I will, I will, I will go look. to Google yeah, and I will look. type in Exodus conference, Hofmir. Okay. Th I mean, that is, so if you say, what extra biblical source do you have? Do you not have a name? One more time, you may hear the audible sound of my head exploding. Um, I, also, I when I look at, it, it, it like, very uh, dubious. the whole story when, is dubious. When, wait, it's, Mo, it's, it doesn't Mo, make sense. we know you hate it. Chill out. If you're going to ask a yeah, question, it just doesn't answer, make sense. I'm going to throw you, dude. So there are, so Got Questions says, there are some figures that imply a total population of Israelites in Egypt at about 2.4 million. But then there's a PDF from JSTOR.com that says, which, you know, is the historical archive. It says that there were different numbers, but the lowest being at about 5,500 involved in the Exodus and the highest being maybe 140,000. So we've got a variation, but I guess I'm not sure where you're getting 2 million. It looks like that number was the total population of people of that ethnicity in Egypt possible. So how many left? That's a, how many like walked away? That's a different question. Looks like the answer is anywhere from 5,500 to 140,000 people. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I just, I mean, you know, did what I said. Okay, yeah, James I'll, I'll look it K, up. James sure, K. Hoffmuir. Yeah, so sure you're going to find like... There's uh, evidence of the of the parting of the Red Sea too, right? That, that's that's. Oh, Mole, you're exhausting. Like, why do you ask these questions? You get an answer, okay? You get because a why nice, do you believe these myths? No, hold stuff. on. It's, it's you silly. get a, hold on, Mole. You get a nice, clean answer, and then instead of Googling it, you think of 13 more, like, sarcastic questions, and I understand the idea behind it. You're asking for, you know, why am I to believe this thing, okay? So we tell you, here's a resource you can go look up. Here's the part that we're not sure about. And then you come back with 30 more, like, oh, yeah, well, what about the fish in the Red Sea? <laughs> Man, like, I don't know. Like, what about the fish in the Red Sea? I can't. Like, you, you just jumped from the historical reliability of the Bible. Okay, we talk about that. Other nations that had conflict in the Israelites. Okay, we talk about that. Now you're worried about the Red Sea. I don't know, man. Like, I don't know I mean, what to be, tell you. Be glad we don't have Moses' staff. I mean, you know, great power. We could not handle great responsibility because anyways. So yeah, for anyone who's curious, James K. Hoffmeyer. I had no idea who this dude was before 10 minutes ago. Thanks, um, Orchid, for bringing that up. So yeah, it just the quickest Google search um, is going to, this guy's got at least 10 books and it looks like hours upon hours of like video lectures and seminars that you can peruse and watch. Um, let's see, what is it? Where was the bio about him? He's like a old Testament scholar, archeologist, Egyptologist, uh, and a professor of the old Testament, ancient near Eastern history and blah, blah, blah. Um, he's got his PhD from university of Toronto. Michael, you may like him. We threw him out. <laughs> Michael's barely <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> Hang on, let's see if it says where he currently lives. Does he still live in Canada? Does he still live in Canada? If he does, he's here illegally. <laughs> <laughs> there are no illegals in Canada, right? There's no illegal humans. Anyone's welcome in Canada. That's almost. They'll never find me when I flee up there. <laughs> no, Steph, you can come stay with us. Uh, I, how rural are you? I want a place with moose and bears and edible plants. Uh, yeah, we're only about 30 minutes. Uh, we're only about 30 minutes east of the third largest city in North America. Sorry. Is it, are you, you're in Toronto or just outside of Toronto? Just east of Toronto. You and I live about two and a half hours from each other. Or are you, are, are you, uh, you're, are you across the, across the lake in like Rochester? Yes, I'm from Rochester originally, but now I'm about two hours south. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a friend who used to, um, used to say, well, he still sails, but, uh, he would go to, uh, regattas in, uh, in Rochester. Yeah. Hey, remember the fast yeah. ferry? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah I do. It's not still running. Oh, is wow, it? this is enthralling. <laughs> not as far. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's running anymore, though I, I could be mistaken. Michael is the second closest person. But yeah, I do, I do remember that. 
Yeah, I've got one guy who's right here in my town that I've run into on Clubhouse. And other than that, Michael is the next closest person to me that I've Maybe, you know, you guys talk about all these signs, right? Maybe that's a sign. You know, like maybe the fact that we live in close proximity. Not necessarily that I should be Christian, but maybe that Steph should become atheist. No, I think it's Just a sign that I should flee to Canada because New York State sucks. Like that's the <laughs> sign that I'm taking. Well, yeah, or, you... or become Canadian. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, I mean, like, and I've said this to you before, but I, I always feel bad for all the like effects snow you get. Yeah, it's rough. I, I, I think it's interesting some of the things that, uh, some of the things that Walter said um and again f fundamentally there are things that he said that i agree with but i think there is a lot to be i don't know if he's still here or whether he took off um i think there's a lot to be said for because there have been lots of times when i've come in asking and not just here but i've gone to other sources like other believers and stuff asking questions they'll, and they'll give me an answer and i mean obviously and this is going to be a no great revelation um, none of the answers have been particularly satisfying, um, but I take them at face value and then I try to go off and investigate them. And if I still have questions, come back. But it, it, it is, it is difficult sometimes, even, even for, even for me to hear someone ask a question and then they'll, it, maybe it's because the answer is unsatisfying or maybe it's because the answer is something that they, they've heard before, but it, it's even frustrating for me sometimes to hear someone ask a question, hear them get an answer and then say, Oh yeah, but what about this? It, it, it almost, it almost sounds like, and Walter's left. So I don't, I don't want to say something. He can't defend himself, but it's almost like, it's almost like looking for more of a, of a, of a gotcha moment. Right. Than a, than a conversation. Yeah. His questions are always good. Like I'm not, if he came in and said, what evidence is there that there was a parting of the Red Sea, then we could have, okay, this is an interesting topic. Let's delve into this. Is there evidence? Is it important that there's evidence? We can have this entire conversation. The problem is that then there's 97 other, like you can tell that the intent is not to find out about whether there was a parting of the Red Sea. It's like evangelizing how stupid Christianity is. And I love Mole. I would say this right to his face. And I have like, Mole, I consider him a buddy. He's a good guy. He's a good dad. Like, I like talking to him. But man, he the has... way he engages is exhausting. Well, he has gotten extra angsty. I, I wonder what's gone on with him recently. Oh, Todd, you got me. Yeah, he... Look, oh, oh, sorry. Not everybody can be. But the way I see it is um, Mole will ask a question and we will answer it. And he's like, oh, darn. And then we, he, answer, he asks another question he thinks that we don't have an answer for. And we have an answer for it. He's like, oh, darn. And so he just keeps going. And then the very last one that he said, and it was pretty key, was, why do you believe these myths, though, Steph? Why do you believe these myths? And it's like, well, we have all this evidence. <laughs> He's like so. the Hell's Energizer Bunny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and we to everyone in the room, we do love Mole. We welcome him on the stage every time. Like I say, he asks good questions. He's never been thrown out of a room. He usually gets boots up booted off the stage within about ten minutes because of this. But no, we love him. He's he's a great, uh, great person to engage with, but at a certain point you just gotta gotta cut it off. It, it's funny that there, there are there are questions that he did ask that that I have asked people as well. Um, and you, and you guys, you know, the collective, you guys, the people in the room have given similar answers, right? But there, I think there's also something, to, something to be said for if you're going to add, there are, and I don't mean this to be, this, this may sound way harsher than I mean it to. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll do my Canadian duty and apologize first. Um, <laughs> but there are certain questions that should that shouldn't be directed at people that aren't experts in certain fields, um, and so to you know to say you know can you you know can you give A B C about X Y Z and yes it is Z not Z. Um, oh, he is Canadian. And and so I I think sometimes if you're going like in in the same way that there are some, there are some believers that will ask things uh, to to an atheist. And when the atheist doesn't have the answer or can't rebut a point that's made, it's like some kind of gotcha moment. Like, well, if you don't have an answer, can't you understand how I'm correct? 
the, the, the reverse is also true, where just because someone asks a believer, like if I was to ask uh, any of you in, like, that are on stage right now, a hyper-specific question, and just because you don't have the answer doesn't mean I'm right. Um, and, and, you know, but like I said, like the reverse is true of, of, both, of both sides, right? And so I think there are times when you need to direct questions to someone who, who may have more, like, um, yeah, just have more expertise in a certain field, if that's fair. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, to the serious person, like, I don't know if you ask some, some question about, yeah, Red Sea evidence right now. I'd be like, I don't know, maybe um, I'd probably Google it and be like, I don't know if this is good or bad, but this is what Google says. Um, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Doesn't mean God's false. I mean, you know, someone or, or something basic, like if someone's just a new Christian or hasn't really read the Bible a whole lot and they ask a question about like earlier, right? Like, oh, why do Jesus and Paul contradict? Because Paul says Christianity is for everyone. Jesus says it's only for the lost sheep of Israel, even though if you keep reading, Jesus clearly explains it is for everyone. But if there's a new Christian that hasn't read that far, they're like, I don't know. I, I guess I guess my Bible has contradictions. And then, you know, the reasonable atheist would be like, um, well, I guess, uh, you know, if they're like, I don't have an answer for that. A reasonable atheist would internally think, OK, well, I know there's an answer. And, uh, you know, this guy may not have it. Doesn't mean his position's wrong. Doesn't mean God's false to, uh, you know, the more non-sincere. But be like, ha, 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 your God is a lie, um, you know. And, and it's funny, it's funny you say that because there are, there are individuals who you interact with where if, if they will tout themselves as authoritarians, then I will, then I will. And I, and you, maybe you guys haven't um, experienced this side of me, but if they tout themselves as authoritarians, I will interrogate them as such um, and, and be much more lenient and much more, and I will be much more impatient and much less charitable when someone simply proclaim, you know, simply proclaim something over and over and over again, or several things over and over and over again, without any possibility to demonstrate anything in any way, shape or form, or even be prepared to offer, uh, offer a citation or have the humility and the humanity to say, you know what, I'm not sure. Uh, let me think about that and get back to you. Um, cause I think sometimes, and I've said this to people before, sometimes the most honest thing, honest thing you can say is, I don't know, especially when you don't know. But anyway. Yeah, those are really good points. And that's why I had mentioned a minute ago, like we could have if he if he picked one topic, let's talk about the parting of the Red Sea. And then we said, Well, here's what we know about it, here's what we don't know about it, is there evidence we're not sure, blah, blah, blah. We we get into it, and then the question comes back to how important is this? Like it's important to mole that there's evidence for everything in the Bible. But then what I point out to him is that he doesn't require the same evidence for other um, histories or other beliefs that he holds. So then kind of like trying to poke at the inconsistency is the is the route I might take over trying to, you know, say that I'm an, an ancient Egyptologist, like, you know, but that, that it always comes down to how important is this? If we're looking at the grand scheme of Christianity, how, it, how crucial is it that we understand the physics of the parting of the Red Sea? And if it's very, very, very important to him, then it's something that I personally would enjoy spending time investigating and getting into him about it, you know, getting into it with him. Um, but I don't suspect that that's the case. I think that it's one thing that if he were given a satisfying answer, he would just move to the next, like, what about Elijah and the chariot? You know, it, it becomes a, well, you're missing the main theme of this thing, right? <laughs> you mean like he did? Right. Well, what's interesting is that, I mean, okay, so to put on my, to put on my little bit more of a, um, for, firmer atheist hat for a second, it, it, it is, it is difficult when you're having these discussions when, you know, like I'll, I will ask, I will ask certain questions, right? Like, and, and Nate, I've, I know I've asked these of you before, right? You know, do you believe, you know, that the Bible is the inspired word of the creator of all things? And you would, of course, say yes. And, you know, if I ask, you know, if you believe that all scriptures, God, breathed and suitable for teaching and instruction, like it says in the Bible, and I know you would say yes. And I imagine, Steph, you would say the same thing. Um. And then when you start to look at, say, well, okay, now let's, let's look at what, you know, let's look at the claims that the Bible makes. And Nate, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact that, that you, that you are charitable enough to say, you know, the Bible makes these claims, 
right? I, I, I appreciate that very much about you. And then you will always, I think you do your best to try to back things up with, thing, you know, the reasons you believe the things that you believe. But then I also appreciate the fact that you have the honesty to say that there are some things that I take on faith, right? I, I appreciate that about you and, and, and others in this space. So, but it's harder sometimes for, for me as an atheist to look at some things and say, well, okay, well, but, okay, but the Bible says this, right? And, and we just, you know, and so, for example, the Bible says that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, okay? And unfortunately, all of science flies in the face of that. Every single solitary field of earth and life sciences says that ain't so. Um, so those are the types of things. And, and maybe that's why when you have someone, you know, that will come in and ask rapid fire questions, it's because underneath the first question that they have, like, so they'll come into a room like this and they'll have a ton of questions, like tons of questions, like, like I have and, and still have in some cases. Um, but they'll ask one and they get either an unsatisfactory answer or something like that. And so they move on to the next one. And so it can appear as though they're like, and I even said this before, that they're rapid firing, maybe looking for a gotcha moment. That, that, that it might be the case that, that, that that's true. But it also might be the case that they have all these questions bottled up inside them. And they're just, and they're looking, you know, and they're just looking for answers. I'm not, I'm not trying to make excuses uh, for anybody. But anyway, that's, that's my two cents on that. No, it makes sense. And so then we have to, that's the part where some grace comes in, um, where it's, why are you asking this? You know, is, are you seeking, like, is this something that you want to believe? And so you are trying to one by one eliminate doubts that you have, or is it that you're evangelizing your own belief? And then that, like, that's one thing that you don't do, Michael, like you're really open about your beliefs, but you're not, um, you're doing a lot of listening and note taking and you push back on things and, it, and it's not an evangelism thing. And I think with certain people, Mole being one of them, it becomes like a man, you guys are so dumb. <laughs> you guys are so dumb. Answer this, answer this. And so feeling out the intention and maybe I'm unfairly, you know, maybe he really is looking for it, but uh, it's not the sense that I get. And we engage with him a lot. Like I said, I really like Mole. I like him. He asks good questions, but it's it's the course of the conversation that becomes difficult to entertain. Yeah, I'm very hesitant to call an individual dumb. Um, I, I think that I, I take something that uh, Lawrence Krauss um, said in one of the talks that I saw him do. He said uh, he was he was talking to a, um, a Muslim apologist named Hamza Sortsis. And uh, he, he was doing this talk and there was uh, because it was at a, um, a Muslim uh, facility, they had segregated the audience and he was very unhappy with that. And he insisted that the audience... Yeah, the, the segregation stop uh, in order for him to continue, and they did that. And so the the um, the talk was segregated anyway. by gender or by religion. Uh, by gender, oh, okay. yeah, males, <laughs> males, and males and females on on separate sides. And so um, when he got up to talk, he said, you know, he said basically explained. He said, look, he, he said, I know that I, you know, I offended some people by doing this. He said, and uh, he, he said, but the reason I, he said, I respect people, but not ideas. And he said because some ideas are ridiculous. And so I think you should be able to have the, and this work gets tossed around a lot here, grace, charitability, to look at someone and say, you know, here's, here's this very, very intelligent person, right? Who, you know, who just, you know, who believes something that may not be um, correct. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll often reference, um, I'll often ref reference Francis Collins, when I mentioned this, right? Here's someone who's, you know, the founder of the Human Genome Project. Clearly, this man is a genius, like an absolute genius scientist. He is also a Bible-believing Christian, right? So it, it's, you know, you, you have to be able to separate those two things. And so to attack an individual is very risky. Um, but you can attack some of the things that they say. And if someone says something silly, I am quite likely to call it out. Um, but, you know, sans ad hominem. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I, I think really like for me like the the hypocrisy or the blindness that someone can't see it like just absolute statements right like I, I appreciate your appreciation uh, Michael but yeah I, I always you know I've been hit with it so much in the early days of, of these discussions 
that, uh, you know, I try to be very mindful of, of the way I say things because, you know, I, I will claim Gnostically, I know this stuff. I, I just know it. But I know that's not how you have conversations with people. So, you know, I'm like, look, for, for, if I was on the other side of this, how am I how am I hearing it? And because people don't have the grace, if I say, look, I know that I know that I know very church term, they're going to be like, no, he's he's crazy. I can't talk to this guy. So it's like, well, how would I hear it if they were doing this to me? And when people do do that to me and I know good and well, they can't prove whatever they're espousing. I'm like, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, so you know it? You know, I know it. I'm like, OK, all right. And internally, I'm thinking this, this is clearly a belief that this guy cannot substantiate. So I, I try to, like, you know, set the groundwork so other people don't have to do that because many of them are not that charitable. So, you know, when, when the other side, when the, you, you know, the secular side makes absolute claims, I really want to hold them to it and be like, look, you can't say what you just said. And then many times, because they don't even know what they're doing or they're not paying attention, like, you know, oh, so you guys believe in myths. You can't say that. Like if you said if you said something different, like I think it's all a bunch of myths. Great. You didn't make an absolute statement. But when you make an absolute statement from the side that overwhelmingly condemns absolute statements void of proof, um, that's not right. And, you know, that's something that I, I'm really not uh, I really just won't let slide very often, uh, often if I if I can think to catch it, because, um, yeah, it's like, well, I'm not going to bend over backwards to accommodate you. Um, if you're not willing to do the same thing, maybe that's a lack of grace on my part, but I think, you know, to keep everyone honest, like, you know, we can't let that slide. Oh, so why do you believe in fairy tales? Oh, well, let me tell you why I believe in fairy tales. Like, no, like you can say you think it's fairy tales, but, um, you know, I know you can't prove it. Can you prove it? Well, no, but blah, 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 blah. Oh, great. You can't prove it. So, um, it's like, let's just be on the same page. Like, you know, you have a bunch of things you, you're not going to call absolute statements. And I have a bunch of things that are clearly beliefs that I will claim I know to myself, but to you, they are beliefs because I can't prove them to you. But um, uh, Steph, Todd, are you guys good for a little bit? I need to make a phone call. Yep. Yeah, Nate, that's a it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good too. Yeah, I think, I think what Nate said was fair. Um, and yeah, you, yeah, it, it is reasonable to call people out for the things that they say on both sides. That, that's an absolutely fair thing. 